Now, some of you out there may be expert corn growers. Some of you may be new to growing corn and want to really try it so you can put some corn in the freezer. So I want to talk about three things you need to know about growing corn. What's up, Lazy Dog fam? I hope everybody out there is having a wonderful day. Today, we're talking all about corn. We're going to take a look at our sweet corn that we have planted behind us here check on that see how that's doing talk about the different types of sweet corn and then we're going to plant some corn some of this glass gym corn that we saved from last year so my original intentions were to talk about all this when we planted this sweet corn i don't know it's been three four weeks ago now but i was kind of in a hurry when we planted this we were going on vacation it was supposed to rain while we're gone i figured this would be a good time to go and get this corn in the ground me and Titus got it planted. We were kind of in a hurry, so didn't have time to film it. Turns out planting it before that much rain was a little bit of a bad idea. So we've got six rows of sweet corn planted right here, and some of the plants are taller than the others because we had to come in and replant some. So we've got some plants that are about, I don't know, 12 to 18 inches tall there. And then we've got some here that are only about six inches tall. So I don't know if you can tell this on camera or not, but this plot is not very level. You usually don't have any issues with getting even water to it with the drip tape. It's just not one of my more level plots. Kind of drops off a little bit on that end right there, kind of towards that pond back there. So what happened is we planted this stuff, went on vacation and it rained a lot more than I thought it was gonna rain. Now these first few rows up here on the level ground that first plant had come up pretty well. We had a few skips in there, but most of that came up pretty well. But down towards where it kind of falls off a little bit, we didn't get very good germination at all. My guess is those seeds washed away or just were drowned or whatever. So we had to come back here and here and replant some of this. And that's why you see some taller plants and some smaller plants there. I started to run out of seeds a little bit as I was replanting this so we don't have perfect spacing out here and this smaller corn is growing pretty fast since it's gotten really hot it's starting to catch up with this other corn and I think it will eventually catch up to it so I think it'll all look all right in the next few weeks when it all catches up with one another it just looks a little patchy right now now some of you out there may be expert corn growers, some of you may be new to growing corn and want to really try it so you can put some corn in the freezer and have it through the cooler months. So I want to talk about three things you need to know about growing corn. So the first thing you need to know, corn is a heavy feeder. That means, as we say down here in the south, it's hungry. So corn likes a lot of water and it also likes a lot of nitrogen. Start off with the water. So we use drip tape to feed our corn. You can water corn from overhead. A lot of the big farmers do it around here with the pivots that are way taller than the corn. Problem with overhead watering corn in a backyard garden situation is that corn is eventually gonna get taller than your sprinkler is. And so it's gonna be really hard to get water down to those corn roots because corn is usually planted pretty densely in a patch. And when you're watering with an overhead sprinkler on taller corn like that, it's hot outside, that water's evaporating just as quick as you're putting it out sometimes. You can water at night to kind of, you know, mitigate some of that, but you're gonna waste a lot of water overhead watering corn, especially when it gets tall. When it's small like this, you can deliver water to it overhead just fine. But once it gets taller, it's really tough to give it enough water via an overhead sprinkler. So I recommend using drip tape if you're on a small scale soaker hose, something like that where you can efficiently get water to those plant roots. So corn is hungry for water. Corn is also hungry for nitrogen. Now, there's lots of synthetic forms of nitrogen that you can use on corn that provide some really quick delivery. But my experiences with those is that they really zap your soil and your soil can be pretty lifeless after that corn is done. So last year, we tried growing corn organically for the first time using mainly those Nature Safe fertilizers like the Nature Safe 1300, which is a great nitrogen source for corn. 
we did that successfully had a really good corn grow out so we're using the organic fertilizers now there are organic fertilizers that can give corn the nitrogen it needs you just got to be a little more timely with the delivery of it but if you do it that way your soils will be in a lot better shape when the corn is done now the second thing you need to know about growing corn is that it is wind pollinated so some things that we plant in the garden some vegetables are insect pollinated things like cucumbers squash watermelons some things are self-pollinating like tomatoes peas peppers and then corn is kind of in its own unique category because it is wind pollinated so when a corn plant matures you've got the tassel up there on top that's the male part of the plant and then you've got the silks which are an extension of the ear that will eventually form. That's the female part of the plant. The pollen on the tassel, the male part of the plant, needs to land on those silks to fertilize the female parts of the plant. And that's what's gonna give you kernels and hopefully a full ear of corn. So we're not relying on insects to pollinate the corn like we are with squash and cucumbers. And the corn is not gonna pollinate itself. We need the wind to do it for us to kind of blow that pollen from the top down to those silks and that's why we like to plant a decent sized little plot of corn because that's going to give us good pollination now if you're planting corn on a small scale just in a little raised bed you can hand pollinate it so when those tassels form and they have pollen on them and you can tell when they have pollen on them because if you shake them a little bit you'll see that dust going everywhere you can walk up to those plants kind of shake them a little bit and that pollen will fall down on that silk. There's way more pollen on that tassel than that silk needs to grow a full ear of corn. So you've got plenty of pollen, plenty of pollen to work with there. I've even did some level or have done some level of hand pollination before with some of my plots. I'll take a piece of long PVC pipe and go in there and kind of brush the top of the tassels and encourage that pollen to kind of fall down make sure I get some good pollination most of the times we get plenty of wind to pollinate things correctly but hand pollination is an option if you're on a small scale and then the third thing you need to know about growing corn is there are lots of different types of corn you got what we call field corn which is usually used to feed animals but some people like to eat it it's not very sweet and you got to pick it just right if you're going to eat it most people let it dry grind it up for grits cornmeal or feed it to animals and you've got popcorn which we grew a lot of last year and still have some in the freezer we've really been enjoying this stuff I don't know that we'll grow any more of this kind of popcorn this year because we still have a bunch in the freezer but that's always a great option to try and then we have sweet corn which is behind us here now as far as the sweet corn goes that's where things can get kind of technical complicated and confusing for some folks but I'll try to explain it as best I can. So you've got three main sweet corn genes. You've got the SU gene, the SE gene, and the SH2 gene. The SU gene is considered the standard gene. SE stands for sugary enhanced. And then the SH2 is basically an abbreviation for the word shrunken. So I like to look at this as kind of a continuum from SU to SE all the way down to SH2. So as we go from SH2 up to SU, the corn gets easier to grow. So the SU varieties, the kind of old school varieties, are easier to grow than the SH2 or the super sweet varieties. And if we go the other way along the continuum from SU down to SH2, the corn gets sweeter and it's gonna hold better and you've got a longer time to harvest it before it gets starchy. So the SU varieties, you gotta be pretty timely when you harvest those and when you harvest them, you either gotta eat them or put them in the freezer pretty quick or they'll get starchy. The SH2 varieties, the really sweet ones, tend to hold for 10 days or so, so you've got a little more time to eat or process the corn. And I'll give you some examples of these. So your SU corns would include Silver Queen, which is probably the most popular one grown in backyard gardens around this area. Everybody loves Silver Queen corn. That's all they've ever grown. They swear there's nothing better. A lot of people growing Silver Queen down here. 
Then for the SE varieties, that includes popular varieties like peaches and cream, ambrosia. There's a lot of SE varieties out there that are really, really popular, and they're all really, really good to eat and fun to grow. And then the SH2, or the super sweet varieties, probably the most popular one is called Obsession. I can't remember the statistic, but someone told me one time the majority of the commercial sweet corn grown around here is all Obsession. So if you're a beginner corn grower, or maybe you don't like your corn to be super, super sweet, you may want to stick with one of those SU varieties like Silver Queen. If you like your corn really sweet, you're pretty good at growing corn, and you want that extra holding ability so you don't have to process it all at one time, you might want to go on those SH2 or super sweet varieties. And then there's always kind of that middle ground there with the SE varieties. And then to complicate things further, the more recent trend with corn genetics is to mix these SU, SE, and SH2 genes get different combinations to bring out certain traits that are desirable. For instance, the SE corns tend to have a nice crunch to them. So one thing that's popular is mixing an SH2 and an SE variety together. So you get the sweetness, but you also get that really nice crunchy texture that you want when you're eating a fresh ear of corn. So nowadays there's all these different combinations out there of these different gene types. You've got what they call synergistic, you've got augmented super sweet, you've got triple sweets, you've got quad sweets. And basically what all those are are just a different ratio of say SH2 kernels to SE kernels on a particular ear of corn. So some of them are more sweeter, some of them they're really trying to go for that crunch. They're just playing with these three basic gene types there to get a desired result. And the one we've really been a fan of lately is the augmented super sweet. So that includes SH2 kernels and SE kernels on the same ear. We grew one called Yellowstone last year, which is bred by a company called Crookham Seeds. And I really, really like their sweet corn varieties. That's pretty much all I grow are seeds bred by Crookham or varieties bred by Crookham. So we did Yellowstone last year, which is in yellow, augmented, super sweet. This year we have another augmented super sweet, and this one is called Solstice. It's a bicolor, so that means it has white and yellow kernels on the same ear. So now back to our patchy Solstice corn here. So we planted this in early April, but I usually plant sweet corn in late March. I planted it as early as middle March. The sweeter the corn, the later you need to wait to plant it. The really sweet varieties need warmer soils to germinate. Things like Silver Queen, I can usually get away with planting those mid-March. Now, I wanted to wait on the soils to warm, but I also had to wait a little bit because that chicken tractor that you see way back there was on this plot and those chickens were grazing a cool season cover crop and giving us some good nitrogen. And it looks like we did indeed get some good nitrogen because these corn plants, albeit small, have a really, really nice color to them on them so far. Now, usually by now in my sweet corn grow out, I would have already side dressed these plants and healed them or pulled some soil to the stalks there to kind of help stabilize them as they grow, keep them from getting blown over if we do have some heavy winds. But the fact that I had to replant some and I've got some uneven plant height in there along the row has kept me from doing that yet. I'm waiting on those second round of plants to get on up about a foot tall or so then we'll side dress and then we'll heal these plants and i think it's going to be okay that we're waiting to do that because like i said we got that nitrogen that the chickens put down everything's looking pretty healthy nothing looks like it's starving so once everything catches up we will then side dress with some nature safe 1300 and we'll pull some soil to those stalks now, if you have a long growing season like we do down here in the south, you can actually succession plant sweet corn. So you get your early spring planting in like this one here, and then you can turn around, you know, I'd say a month later, plant another round. And down here, if we wanted to, we could probably squeeze three, four plantings of sweet corn in between spring and fall. I used to always grow a fall crop of sweet corn. I didn't last year because we put so much in the freezer from our spring crop, but it can be done. The thing to note as you plant later 
into summer or in late spring, early summer, midsummer, late summer, that corn is going to grow a lot faster, just like that second planting is starting to catch up with that first planting. So as things get hotter, the corn grows faster. Because it's growing faster, you got to be a little more timely with your fertilizer applications. That way it gets the nutrients it needs to grow out properly. With that really fast growing corn in those summer months, what can happen if you don't feed it right is you end up with some short corn that tassels out at about you know three four foot tall but if you feed it right it should make it on up to about five six seven foot tall the other thing to note about succession planting sweet corn as it gets hotter that corn earworm pressure is going to escalate and Whereas with this sweet corn, we probably won't worry about spraying it for worms until we start seeing some silks. If you plant in the middle of summer, you probably want to just start spraying once that corn gets on up a few feet tall because you know you're going to have worm pressure. And if that worm pressure gets really bad, what they'll do is basically eat the top out of that corn plant and you won't get a tassel at all. So you got to really stay on top of your worm spraying if you're growing corn in the middle of the summer. Now, if you want the corn to be true to variety, you definitely want to stagger your plantings by several weeks. I would say three weeks is probably a safe bet, if not four weeks. If you don't care about being true to variety, you can plant it, you know, one week after the other. You may want to plant a super sweet and then a week later plant an SE variety and have your own, you know, augmented super sweet that you've created in your garden. But if you want it to be true to variety, wait a few weeks between plantings that way it doesn't cross pollinate and you get what the seed packet said you were going to get now in the case of this glass gem corn here that we're going to plant in a minute i wanted to give this sweet corn a head start so i didn't have to worry about any cross pollination now this sweet corn is going to mature it should mature a good bit faster than this glass gem corn but i didn't want to take any chances because i want to keep my glass gem seed corn line true without any cross pollination from sweet corn. So now that that corn is up and going, we should have no issues planting this today. This will be pollinated and done, probably already harvested by the time this stuff starts forming tassels and silks. And one more thing about this corn before we mosey on to the other side of the barn and plant that glass gem. We do have some weeds popping up here along the row. I've been keeping between the rows wheel hoed pretty good, but we got some weeds around these plants here. I'm not super worried about that because when we heal the plants, probably in the next week or so, we'll smother all those, we'll cover them with soil, and they should no longer be an issue after that. Okay, now here on the other side of the barn, let's talk a little bit more about this glass gem corn, where we're putting it, how much we're planting, and why we're growing it. So this is our biggest plot, which I tend to split in half just because it's so big. I don't ever want to plant this much of one thing, so we tend to split it in half or kind of two-thirds, one-thirds at some time. So we have our indeterminate tomatoes strung up right there, and we've got straw on those. What I did down here, because I'm probably going to end up feeding this corn a lot more than those tomatoes, is I've got some valves right here on both sides of my T for my drip setup. So if I want to really heavily feed that corn, I can just feed the corn and not feed the tomatoes. And for some reason, I want to just feed the tomatoes and not feed the corn. I can do that as well. So this is where we had that Blonza clover all throughout the winter months. And the chickens grazed this. I think they went over it at least two times, maybe three times. We had plenty of time to get it incorporated, get it terminated, and we've got some nice soil out here now. Those cover crops really help condition the soil, and we should have a good bit of nitrogen here. So I've already came in and laid the drip tape, got everything connected. I just need to cover it up. We're doing nine rows of this stuff, three foot apart. I was able to get the rows pretty straight just by eyeballing them. That row there is a little crooked, but that just means we'll be able to put more corn seed in that row. So why are we going to plant so much of this glass gem corn, which is traditionally thought of as more of an ornamental corn? Well, I don't really know why I'm planting so much of it. The kids had a blast with it last year. We had a lot of fun picking it and shelling it and stuff, and so I thought I'll just grow even more of it this year. Last year, I planted six 30-foot rows 
over there in the dream garden and this is what we got pretty much a gallon bag slap full of kernels here now that corn was grown dead in the middle of summer it looked pretty pitiful for its entire life we ended up getting a decent harvest off of it but it wasn't great a lot of the ears were small on it so i've got higher expectations growing it now in kind of mid to late spring i think it'll do a lot better than planted in the middle of summer so from this grow out here we'll probably get a lot more than just a gallon bag of this stuff and i'm sure i won't even come close to using this whole bag not even half this bag just to plant these nine rows here i don't know what i'm going to do with all this glass gym corn if it does grow out successfully here i'm sure we may feed some to the chickens we may grind some up into cornmeal and make grits out of it we may just have fun with some of it who knows what we're going to do with it but it's going to be fun to watch and see it grow and it's always fun to see all the different ears because each ear is different each ear has a different color pattern on it so as i showed you earlier we've already got our drip lines laid down here in a furrow i also added a scoop per row of that nature safe 10 to 8 because our soil test told us that we had plenty of phosphorus here we were kind of marginal on potassium and you can't really give corn too much nitrogen so that's why we went with a 10 to 8. so now what i'm going to do is turn this drip on so these pieces of tape here will straighten up a little bit we'll get them covered up and then we'll be ready to plant All right, whew, that was a bit of a workout. Now that soil may look pretty sandy and lifeless, but there's actually a good bit of organic material in that soil and it is heavy to push through with that wheel hoe. It's not hard like clay, it's just dense and it's just so heavy, it provides a lot of resistance as you're pushing through it. So even though it's soft, man, it's some heavy, heavy soil with a lot of good stuff in it. From all them cover crops we've been growing now as a little side note i'm trying some new to me drip tape on this plot right here i've used quite a few different brands over the years some i like more than others this is the iritech p1 line i got this from drip depot they have it on several different roll sizes or roll lengths i think this is a thousand foot roll now i didn't think i was gonna like it because it has these kind of hard emitters in it as opposed to the tape where it just has a hole punched in the tape for the emitters but i can say this is the least leakiest drip line i've ever used so far with drip irrigation you're going to have little minor dribbles and leaks at the connections because they're not glued they're just punched in there but this stuff right here seems to tighten up a lot better than the rivulus tape I've used and even that other ear tech tape I've used. With the hard emitters, you just gotta be careful. You can't cut it right on top of an emitter because you can't put your connection there. So you have to kind of cut around the emitters when you're securing your connections. But besides that, I really, really like this stuff so far. And if you're watching on YouTube, I'll put a link below, a Drip Depot affiliate link for this stuff if you wanna give it a try. So now back to the glass gem corn here. I'm gonna try to use my walk behind planter because nine rows is a little too much to plant by hand one of the issues i may have here has to do with seed size so since this is our own saved seed stock we've got seeds of all different sizes here when we harvested this corn last year we had big ears we had little ears that means we've got some big kernels and some little kernels so i'm just gonna have to err on the side of over planting so I took this seed plate and I drilled out the holes to accommodate the largest seeds in this batch here. That also means that some of those smaller seeds may stack in these holes and end up planting a lot of doubles. But hey, we'll do what we gotta do to get it planted. I'd rather come thin it out later than not get it planted thick enough. So now there ain't nothing to it but to do it. Hopefully our seeder will cooperate and we'll get all these nine rows planted. all right all right all right that actually went quite well old betsy here only jammed on me a couple times on that second row and the last row so that 
number three seed plate there with the holes drilled out actually performed quite well considering the range of seed sizes we were working with. And I know I planted it too thick, but that's all right because I actually enjoy thinning corn. It's just something soothing about it to me coming out here late in the evening when the sun's about to go down, it's nice and cool and just taking my time thinning out my corn rows. And we didn't even begin to put a dent in our bag of glass gem corn seed here. You really can't even tell we used any of it. So I'll go back in the freezer with this. Who knows what we'll do with it or better yet, if any of you guys out there would like to try some of this, let me know in the comments below and we'll try to figure out some way to put some of this in smaller packages on the website. And so one of my kind of end goals with this glass gem corn is to keep growing it down here year after year saving our own seed stock and see if any kind of local adaptability generates when we grew it last summer i was thinking man this corn doesn't do well down here in the south in the heat it eventually ended up making an okay harvest but it didn't look anything like the corn that we normally grow now from what i remember from my genetics classes way back in the days it takes about six generations for any real local adaptability to establish in a gene line so we're a long ways from that we're going to keep saving our seed and keep growing at least a little bit of it year after year and we'll just see what happens so i hope you enjoyed the video today all things corn talking about corn looking at corn planting corn corn and more corn let me know what varieties of corn you're growing this year if any in the comments below sweet corn popcorn field corn whatever Tell me what you're growing in your backyard garden. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure to check out our affiliate links below. A lot of great companies we use in our gardens around here at Lazy Dog Farm. I also have a link for that drip tape at Drip Depot, so you can check that out if you want to give that a try. Don't forget to go check out our website, LazyDogFarm.com, where we've got recommended products, our garden blog, recipes, Lazy Dog Farm shirts and hats, all kind of good stuff over there. If you did enjoy the video, make sure to subscribe. Hit that notification button, like, and share, and we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm. Old farewell mm -hmm. By the beauty of your life